Welcome back, everyone. Well, I've had a bunch of people bombarding me with messages saying, uh, Armchair Historian has a video out about Antietam. You have to do a reaction to it. So here we are. And uh, it's also an opportunity for me to uh, drop some hints about uh, something that's coming a couple weeks away. I already made a little bit of a reference to it in a post, but I can tell you a bit more now. Uh, in August, in mid-August, I'm going to be spending three full days on the Antietam battlefield making videos for a complete series of videos for you guys. It's going to be a pretty lengthy series. I don't know how many videos yet, but at least a dozen or more. Uh, it's going to be at least twice as long as my uh, Gettysburg series was, and it won't be just me. My friend JD from the History Underground is going to be there. Uh, our friend Gary Edelman from uh, the American Battlefield Trust is going to be joining us for a day while we're there. So we're still working out the details, but going to be doing some collaborations. There may be a couple of other channels involved as well, and there are probably some other locations besides just Antietam in that area that we may be going. I got myself an Airbnb right in Sharpsburg, so I'm going to be staying in a house built in 1856 in town. Super excited about that. So more details to follow. But let's go ahead and dive into this battle. Uh, I'm in the process right now uh, over the next several weeks of doing my research. I don't know nearly as much about Antietam compared to what I know about a battle, say, Gettysburg or Vicksburg. So I'm uh, absorbing all the information I can right now. I've got a couple of books on the way uh, that are going to help with that. So um, if I were to do this three weeks from now, I could probably fill in, a, fill in a lot more than I can today. But I'm excited to see how our friend Griffin has put together uh, his presentation of America's bloodiest day, Antietam. Let's dive in. Our new game, Fire Ant Maneuver, is yes, out I have on it. Steam for free and has an American Civil War expansion. Going to be playing that on my gaming channel soon. General George B. McClellan cannot believe his eyes. A corporal marching through an abandoned Confederate campsite has discovered a dispatch written in Robert E. Lee's own hand. Detailed intelligence about Confederate troop dispositions in the state of Maryland and Lee's plan to move his army to attack Washington, D.C. I didn't realize that was written in Robert E. Lee's own hand. I have to look this up now. Okay, that's what I thought. Uh, so, unfortunately, uh, we've got to correct an error right off the bat. Robert E. Lee did not write this in his own hand. It would have been really unusual, especially for a lengthy order like this, of which several copies would need to be made because they were general orders that were going out to all his commanders. It doesn't make any sense for that to have been written in Robert E. Lee's own hand. And it's actually uh, by command of General R. E. Lee, R. H. Chilton, Assistant Adjutant General. That's who wrote the, the orders. So they're wrapped around three cigars, a copy of these orders. Uh, it's called Special Order 191. Uh, were lost. And they basically detailed exactly what Robert E. Lee's plan was. So... Um, before I get too far ahead of myself, though, I don't know if he's going to get into any details about what's happening leading up to Antietam. So let, let me watch a little bit more of the video before I fill you in on that. McClellan reads the dispatch over and over again. Memories of his failure to take the Confederate capital of Richmond fresh in his mind. He hears the chittering of his peers who think he stole command of Washington's defense from more worthy commanders. It is this same McClellan who has just been handed the document that could win the war. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. When Robert E. Lee's order fell into George McClellan's hands, the mighty United States was engaged in a desperate bid for survival. Political and ethical conflict had left the young nation riven in two, and the breakaway Confederate States of America had proven surprisingly resolute in their battle against the federal government, and had attracted the attention of foreign powers who imported southern cotton. A revolving door of high commanders had failed to lay the rebels low, and political pressure mounted on President Lincoln to end the increasingly unpopular war. So at this point, there hasn't really been a revolving door of commanders. That's going to come in the next couple months. But at this point, so what you have is um, in the east, the, the theater that we're talking about, which is basically the area between Washington, D.C. and Richmond, the two capitals of these countries that are fighting. Uh, you have Union, uh, a Union Army is formed under Irvin McDowell. 
and uh, I think it's called the Army of Northeastern Virginia is what it's initially called. And um, he loses the Battle of Bull Run, uh, is replaced by George McClellan. McClellan's kind of this young prodigy. He's, he's in his late 30s. Uh, he was like a teenager when he uh, goes to West Point, a very young, like a couple of years younger than most people entering West Point. I want to say he was like 16 when he went to West Point. And, uh, super intelligent guy. He's an engineer. He has worked on, you know, run railroads. Um, he, he's somebody that everybody thinks very highly of. And so he's placed in command of the army after the debacle at Bull Run. And so, you know, from the fall of 61 all the way to the spring of 62, he's basically training the army, but not moving the army. He finally gets pressured to move. He decides on uh, what we know today as the Peninsula Campaign. He loads all the army on boats, takes them down uh, to the peninsula, down near Yorktown. And they start moving up the peninsula and they stop at Williamsburg and they get delayed by a really small Confederate force. And this is going to start to define who McClellan is. He, he's defi uh, described as having a permanent case of the slows. He constantly thinks the enemy has more men than they do. Uh, one of the problems is he's loved by the army. He's very popular with the men. And when you're that popular with the men and when you love your men, uh, there's that famous speech in... Um, that is attributed to Robert E. Lee in the movie Gettysburg, where he's talking to uh, General Longstreet, and he tells him, you know, uh, to be a good uh, commander, you have to love the army, but to be a good general, you have to be willing to order the death of the thing that you love, or something to that effect. And, and uh, McClellan loved the army, but he was never really willing to risk uh, to take any great risks. And because he thought he was outnumbered, he wouldn't take any risks. And so uh, the whole Peninsula campaign's a debacle. John Pope is brought from the east to take command of another army, it loses the Second Battle of Bull Run. McClellan is put back in command of all of these forces in Virginia. Uh, and, and so then he's going to go north to head off Robert E. Lee, who's decided to invade the north for the first time, moving into Maryland. So not really a revolving door. McClellan has had command for the better part of a year at this point. Um, and, and Pope was in command of some of the troops, but McClellan is going to get his last shot here. The Union needed to turn the tide, and in this video we will examine the Battle of Antietam, the bloodiest day in American history, which cost over 22,000 casualties. Fittingly enough, the sponsor of today's video is War and Peace Civil War, a free online strategy game that allows you to fight your own battle of Antietam and rewrite history as leader of either the Union or Confederate armies. Take your soldiers across dozens of maps accurately modeled on historical battle sites while taking advantage of a base building system that lets you equip your men with a powerful arsenal of authentic 19th century weapons. Engage in large-scale PvP conflicts with other players, which test your knowledge of Civil War tactics, guiding your men to victory alongside famous historical figures like Abraham Lincoln or Jefferson Davis. If you're ready to step into the shoes of a general at Antietam, then you can download the game for free using the link in the description below. As the smoke cleared from the South Mountain battles, Lee's Army of Northern Virginia was able to consolidate around the town of Sharpsburg. So he, he mentioned South Mountain. There were some other battles as well. These are actually really important battles uh, as part of the Antietam campaign because uh, there are delaying actions that are happening. And, you know, so uh, McClellan finds these orders and... and Lee only went north with like 50 some thousand men anyway and then he he actually divides his army uh, and so he's going to end up at, at the Battle of Antietam Sharpsburg as it's called in the south uh, with somewhere around 40,000 maybe even a little bit less McClellan's going to have him two to one at Sharpsburg but these delaying actions that get fought at places like South Mountain are going to buy time for Lee to consolidate as much of his army as he can uh, and, and I honestly if, if Anybody else but McClellan had been in command uh, on the peninsula. If anybody else in command uh, had been in command at Antietam, I think we see a much shorter war because these were real opportunities that aren't going to come along again in the East uh, until at least two years down the road. Uh, missed opportunities like you wouldn't believe here. 
McClellan did not pursue the rebel forces for a full two days after South Mountain, his men arriving at Sharpsburg on September 16th, and Major General Joseph Hooker's 1st Corps crossing the Antietam Creek to engage the rebels' outermost defenses that afternoon. Yeah, people forget this too. Honestly, we talk about Antietam being the bloodiest day, September 17th, a one-day battle, but it really wasn't. It was really a two-day battle. Uh, this fighting that happens in the East Woods between Hooker's men and Stonewall Jackson's men uh, really should be considered the start of the battle, and I'm going to cover some of that when I go there. Uh, there's skirmishing. There's not a lot of casualties, but there is some light skirmishing that's taking place here, and then the battle is going to commence proper really super early, like 5.30 on the morning of the 17th. And by the time you get to to about 7, 7.30 in the morning, there have already been more casualties just in Hooker's first corps than the entire Union Army had suffered at the Battle Bull Run a year before. Lee took this skirmish as a sign that McClellan would focus his attack on the Confederate left, and he gave command of the flank to the legendary Stonewall Jackson. The rebel center and right were given to General James Longstreet, and Lee placed his cavalry in any gaps between his sides and center. So, um, it, the easiest way to think of the Battle of Antietam, think of it as three very distinct battlefields. You have the northern battlefield, this is the cornfield, the Dunker Church, the Sunken Lane, those kinds of things up here. That's the first corps, the 12th corps. Um, for the Union, that's Stonewall Jackson for the Confederates. Uh, you have the middle battlefield right here, and then you've got the very famous battlefield on the left flank of the Union Army, that's Burnside Bridge, that's Burnside with the Ninth Corps. Though Hooker's skirmishing would appear to telegraph the Union strategy, we do not know the exact Federal battle plan. Hooker's movements indicate that McClellan planned to use a strategy known as an echelon assault, a series of pushes against various points of the enemy line in sequence, pushes the enemy must constantly commit and recommit their reserves to push back. Now, my understanding is that, I, I could be wrong, I'm still studying this battle in depth, uh, I think Hooker understood it differently. I think Hooker was under the impression that all the attacks were going to happen at the same time. The, uh, the center, the, the left, and the right all at the same time. Uh, and, and honestly, by the time the, the middle attack commences, the battle where Hooker and Mansfield are with the 1st and 12th Corps is pretty well over at that point. This, theoretically, leads to the enemy both running out of reserve troops and expending their energy, turning back a series of assaults by fresh formations, eventually breaking under one crucial push. McClellan's echelon assault would begin with Hooker on the Confederate left, then move to the center with pushes under Generals Mansfield and Sumner, before the coup de grace would be delivered by facial hair pioneer General Ambrose Burnside. However, confusion in the Federal Command would see troops deployed throughout the night, with the reserves sent to reinforce Hooker at 2.30 in the morning, receiving little time to rest yeah. before the battle began. Yeah, if they didn't arrive till 2.30 in this battle, the, the attack on the cornfield commences at about 5.30. Three hours, not a lot of time at all. Five forty-three a.m., September 17th. General Hooker's men march south toward Dunker Church, assuming they are circling around the Confederate flank and outmaneuvering the rebels. But roughly half an hour's march brings the Federals into contact with Stonewall Jackson's forces, who hold a line stretching from a cornfield to the East Woods. And remember what I said earlier, the Unions got them two to one. Lee's got somewhere just under 40,000 men available. The Union's got at least 80,000, may, maybe 75, uh, but they've got them two to one. And there's, so there's no reason at all they shouldn't be able to get around their flanks, but it doesn't work out that way. The Federals drive the Confederates from the East Woods and the Cornfield, squeezing them into the West Woods. And, and this right here, might be, I mean, there's there's probably some other places you could argue could compete with it. This might be the deadliest place in all of North America in terms of the number of casualties in the short amount of time. Uh, I mean, you know, we tend to think of things like the attack 
uh, in uh, the first week of June at Cold Harbor or Pickett's Charge or Franklin. Uh, but pound for pound, man, uh, the number of dead that happen in this cornfield and on this part of the battlefield, this very small area of the battlefield is just horrific. Bringing them into range of the 14 Confederate guns on Nicodemus Hill. Hooker sends 26 pieces to counter the rebel artillery as Major General Ricketts launches an overwhelming assault on the Rebs. And in Hooker's uh, corps, the first corps, I believe one of his division commanders is George Meade. Uh, so interestingly, you know, Hooker is going to take command. of It's going to be Burnside who's going to replace McClellan. And then Hooker's going to replace Burnside and then Meade's going to replace Hooker. But right now Meade's just a division commander. Driving straight into the center, Ricketts men meet seven Confederate brigades and shatter them, devastating the Confederate position in under two hours of intense battle. Even the legendary Stonewall Division was severely mauled in the assault. There's no Stonewall Division, there's a Stonewall Brigade, um, but not a Stonewall Division. And General Lee saw his flank nearing collapse. Luckily for the Confederacy, McClellan's echelon assaults mean that the rest of Lee's army is unengaged and able to assist. Lee yep. is able to- And this is the worst thing that you can have happen. Basically, you have the opposite of what happens at Gettysburg, where uh, the Union has that very famous fish hook line with good tight interior lines so they can reinforce easily, and the Confederates are much more stretched out. That's what's happening here. The Confederates have the tight interior lines, and because the attack's only happening on the Confederate left, they can reinforce from other places where they're not being attacked. If you're McClellan and you've got a two to one advantage, of course, granted, he didn't think he did. He didn't know he did, because he always thinks the enemy has more men than they do. You attack everywhere at once, you don't give him that chance. And that's what Hooker thought was happening pull two brigades under Hood to reinforce the flagging line, and these additional forces push back against the Federal onslaught. Hood's men are outnumbered and hungry, but the element of surprise sees the gray-clad scarecrows gain the upper hand in the cornfield. This is a major turning point in this part of the battlefield. Is I think Hood is basically Jackson's last reserve, uh, and he sends him in, and Hood is able to uh, stave off what otherwise might have been defeat on the Confederate left. Federal gunners begin shelling the area, and the Rebs must contend with both enemy artillery and a sudden pivot by the 7th Wisconsin, who circles around Iron to Brigade. attack Hood's left. The Rebs are forced to go on the defensive, but hold their ground in the rain of shells and the waves of Wisconsinites. Yeah, that's the Iron Brigades right in the middle of this. I think... I think the Irish Brigade is in here too. I can't remember for sure though, but I know the Iron Brigade is right there in the thick of this fight in the cornfield. The counterattack has stalled out, but at least the Confederate flank is secure. And they, I should mention too, this is right after the Iron Brigade got their name. This is their first battle since they've been named the Iron Brigade. They earned that name uh, at one of the battles leading into Antietam. The soldiers who fought in the cornfield would recall this engagement as among the most savage in the war. Definitely. Confederate Colonel William Tatum Woford would call the situation in the melee desperate, while General Hooker would recall that the slain lay in rows precisely as they had stood in their ranks. And listen, Hooker, I'm telling you, man, I mean, a lot of people give Hooker a bad rap because of Chancellorsville, because he got whipped at Chancellorsville. Hooker had gotten his bell rung pretty good by an artillery shell at the beginning of that battle, and I think, honestly, he just was not himself. There's a reason that he was nicknamed Fightin' Joe Hooker. He was a fantastic corps commander, uh, and he ends up redeeming himself later on. He does pretty well leading an army uh, under Grant uh, out in the Western Theater at places like Chattanooga. So... Don't mistake Hooker for one bad battle at Chancellorsville. Hooker's an excellent Corps commander. A few moments before, it was never my fortune to witness a more bloody, dismal battlefield. As best we can tell, McClellan's echelon assault plan next called for Hooker's move against the Confederate left to be followed by a drive Mansfield. against the Confederate center by Major General Mansfield. Naturally, Mansfield was not apprised of this, and when word of Hooker's men being waylaid by Hood's counterattack reaches him, Mansfield assumes his duty is to support the flagging assault on the left. 
Hooker advises Mansfield to dig in and not to expend his men or energy on the cornfield and the west woods, instead fortifying the east woods. The momentum of the intended assault series is broken as the Federals hunker down before being engaged by Confederate infantry. Mansfield makes for the front and is promptly stopped by his own horse, who refuses to jump a fence, forcing him to lead his mount on foot around the fence line and to the Federal position. Somewhere on his path from the fence to his men in the fog of war, General Mansfield is fatally shot by an unknown Union soldier, most likely mistaken for a rebel scout or officer. All right, so the reason I stopped is when he said that Mansfield was killed by his own men, I, I don't think that's clear. I think Mansfield thought he was killed by his own men. So so Mansfield rides over to, uh, to uh, see what's happening on the line. And here's a picture of Mansfield taken not long before he died. He was almost 60 years old. He's one of the older commanders there. He was a distinguished officer who had uh, been... Um, uh, cited for bravery during the Mexican-American War. He had been made the Inspector General of the Union Army in the 1850s. Uh, Well-known, well-sought-after uh, commander. Uh, and so, uh, 58 years old from Middletown, Connecticut, uh, when he gets hit um, at about 7 o'clock in the morning, it says... Uh, his horse was shot in the right leg. Mansfield was hit in the right breast by a bullet. Passing still in front of our line and nearer to the enemy, he attempted to ride over the rail fence, which separated a lane from the plowed land where most of our regiment were posted, wrote Lieutenant John Gold, uh, an adjutant of the 10th Maine. Uh, the horse would not jump it. The general dismounting led him over. He passed to the rear of the regimental line when a gust of wind blew aside his coat and I discovered that his whole front was covered with blood. I ran to him and asked if he was hurt badly. Gould continued. He said, yes, I shall not live. I am shot by one of our own men. Uh, he was carried to the rear where he died the next day. Uh, but uh, Mansfield had been yelling at his troops who were firing into the woods, telling them, no, you're firing on our own men. And the men said, no, we're not. Those are the enemy that are firing at us from the woods. And uh, so, yeah, it is not clear uh, about this. And this is a whole, um, this blog is kind of dealing with that issue. Um, it is really, I, I guess I don't feel comfortable saying that he was killed by his own men. I think it's much more likely he was killed by the enemy. Um, but I guess we really just don't know for sure. The Union loses a second commander when Hooker is shot in the foot, retiring from the battlefield and leaving one General Williams in command. Alpheus With Williams. no guidance from the retreating Hooker and no knowledge of McClellan's overall strategy, Williams defaults to the offensive. And uh, the 12th Corps was taken over by Henry Slocum, who would command the 12th Corps at Gettysburg and beyond, uh, another uh, well-known commander who I think did really well. Ordering an assault be launched from the federal position in the East Woods. The battered Union forces break out of the wood line and make for Dunker Church, securing the landmark and the nearby high ground after bitter fighting. It is now 8.15 a.m. Yeah, so all of this happens and we're only less than three hours into the fight. Uh, and there's a long way to go yet. Uh, I think Hooker thought the Dunker Church was a schoolhouse from a distance when he saw it. And, and when he gave that as kind of one of their uh, objectives, he described it, I think, as a schoolhouse. But it was. It was a, it was a, a local church. Um, they were known as the Dunkers. They used the Antietam Creek as a place to baptize by immersion, which is, you know, full under the water. Fifteen minutes pass, and the first elements of the Federal Second Corps arrive under the oldest field commander in the war, General Sumner. Sumner's men were due over an hour ago, and the second advances to link up with their comrades at Dunker Church. The combined forces drive against the remnants of Stonewall Jackson's line, but the Rebs face no grand charge that would rout them as the Federals come piecemeal. The staccato offensives are easily driven off by Jackson, who is able to bring his strength to bear against each of the attacks in turn, and a tug of war develops between Jackson and the Federals. Lee, banking on a lack of other movement from the Union, sends two more brigades from his southern positions to reinforce Jackson in the north, severely weakening the areas they are pulled from. 
the now twice reinforced rebels launch a full counterattack, descending upon the left flank of the Union counteroffensive at the Westwoods. General Howell Walker, who commanded a rebel brigade at the Westwoods, wrote that, the counterattacking rebel divisions advanced in splendid style, firing and cheering as they went, and in a few minutes cleared the woods. Federal General Gorman noted that the attack of the enemy on the flank was so sudden and in such overwhelming force that I had no time to lose. And the Union indeed loses no time in retreating over 200 yards before the Confederate attack. The retreating Federals would encounter the advancing 6th Corps under General Franklin, who had orders to occupy the high ground seized earlier to protect lines of communication. But for his part, Franklin was keen to give the Rebels a fight. Frank so one of the things you'll notice here is you're going to hear a lot of names that by the time we get to Gettysburg a year later, you're not hearing as Corps commanders. Franklin's not a Corps commander anymore. Of course, Mansfield is killed. Um, Hooker is not a Corps commander anymore. Um... Sumner is not a Corps commander anymore. So it gives you a sense of the turnover that's happening uh, among the Union High Command, not just with their uh, commanding officer of their army, but also even at the Corps level. So, you know, by the time you get to Gettysburg and you've got guys like um, like Reynolds and, um, and Sykes and Sedgwick and um, who else? Dan Sickles. I mean, these are all guys who are fairly new to Corps command. Franklin makes his feelings Hancock. known to General Sumner, commander of the retreating forces, and a dispute breaks out over whether to keep up the retreat or turn and fight. McClellan himself is called to the front line to resolve this matter. But while the rebels are on the offense in the Westwood, others under one General Hill face a federal offense at the Bloody Lane, a sunken farm road. Hill's command had been seriously mauled in the South Mountain battles, but over the course of the day has absorbed the remnants of formations shattered in that morning's fighting, as well as other odds and ends of the rebel army. So the, the Sunken Lane's a really fascinating place on the battlefield, and they've got a tower there that you can go up and kind of get a really nice view. There's this wide open field of fire, and the Sunken Lane is kind of almost like a natural uh, trench for the Confederates, and there's these famous pictures that were taken at the Antietam battlefield in the days after where you see all the Confederate dead laying in the sunken lane. The Union forces under General French charge headlong at the emplaced Confederates who turn them back handedly. French's men pay dearly for each and every attempt, and not even reinforcements from the famous Irish Brigade are Irish able Brigade. to turn the tide. General Robert E. Rhodes, commanding half of the forces at the Bloody Lane, spots a gap in the Union line and orders a countercharge that is stopped dead by quick defensive maneuvering on the Union side. Rhodes orders a subordinate to take up a defensive position on the right, but this order is misunderstood as a command to retreat. Rhodes watches, dumbfounded, as his right flank withdraws, followed by the rest of his men. The rebels abandon Bloody Lane, literally handing their position over to the Federals. The upshot of all this... All right, so before we get too far, I want to talk about uh, one of the stories from the Bloody Lane that has always fascinated me, and that's the story of John B. Gordon. So let's go to that for a second. All right, so Gordon, uh, during the Battle of Antietam, September 17th, he was ordered to hold a vital portion of the sunken road. When General Lee asked whether he could hold his ground, Gordon replied his men could do so until the sun goes down or victory is won. He fulfilled his promise and held the line against repeated federal assaults, but the success came at high personal cost. He was wounded five times that day. The first ball passed through his right calf. The second struck higher up in the same leg, but as neither had struck bone, he remained on the field. A third bullet pierced his left arm, but he remained with his men despite the fact that muscles and tendons in his arm were mangled and a small artery was severed by this ball. A fourth one he pierced his shoulder, but he remained on the line. Finally, he was stopped by a ball that hit him in the face, passing through his left cheek and out his jaw. This ball pitched him forward unconscious, landing with his face in his cap. And it's likely the only thing that saved him from drowning in his own blood was that a bullet hole in his cap allowed blood to drain out as he lay prostrate on the ground. As he recovered from his wounds, he was promoted to Brigadier General and given command of a brigade. Eventually, he would rise to Corps Command within the Army of Northern Virginia. 
this miscommunication and redeployment was that Lee's forces were all but entirely concentrated in the north, with Burnside on deck for the next stage of the Echelon assault to the south. Burnside finds himself commanding a full corps against a skeleton crew. McClellan allegedly orders Burnside to advance over the Antietam Creek Bridge at 8 a.m. and sees the high ground beyond to advance upon Sharpsburg, an order that should have reached him an hour and a half later. With the fortunes of battle being what they are, hypothetically Burnside should have been able to steamroll over the bridge and accomplish his objectives by noon. Burnside, his pride still wounded by his commanders being shuffled around, essentially ignored McClellan. It took a second written command, followed by a visit by the Inspector General, the Army's highest law enforcement officer, to get the petty Burnside moving. I feel like maybe that's a little unfair to Burnside to call him petty in this situation because honestly, um, the other officers could act pretty petty toward Burnside too. And Burnside k takes command of the Army. Um, not long after this in November. Uh, and the only reason that Lincoln waits until November to replace McClellan after this is because McClellan is a prominent Democrat. Uh, he's a war Democrat, which Lincoln needed the war Democrats. Um, and so he waits until after the congressional elections in November, and then he fires McClellan the next day, replaces him with Burnside. After the Battle of uh, Fredericksburg, which Burnside was failed mightily by a lot of other people, uh, it was actually a pretty good plan. It just didn't work out because of factors that were out of Burnside's control. And listen, I'm no Burnside apologist. He had his own flaws, and he shouldn't have been command of the army. But um, after that battle, a bunch of Union generals uh, under Burnside's command go behind his back and go to Washington and basically get him replaced. Uh, so there's a lot of pettiness going on both ways when it comes to all of this. When they finally get to the bridge, Burnside's forces drive Confederate skirmishers away before splitting off. The main force makes to fight its way across the bridge while a splinter force goes to ford the river downstream. Yeah, and it's not right next to it. When I go there, you'll get a sense, and I've actually done a, a video there many years ago. Um, first of all, this bridge is not very wide. You know, maybe three or four guys wide you can get across. Basically, you can get you know, a company at a time across this bridge. Um, they ford, it's, it's down and around the corner. There is a spot where they can ford, and eventually that's how they're going to uh, win this location is by fording uh, down, uh, down a little further down. But it's not right next to it here. But this is kind of an uh, incredible stand by a small group uh, of Confederates under Cobb. Uh, but they've got incredible position. I mean, it's a really high spot that looks directly down on this bridge. Defending the bridge is a single rebel brigade under General Robert Toombs, who oh, has Toombs, his men lay down right. heavy it's fields Toombs. of fire across the bridge. The Union fights hard and takes the bridge in short order, but due to Burnside's previous stalling, he must take time to consolidate his men before driving onto Sharpsburg. It is 2 p.m., and the fighting in the north has concluded. Lee's army is spent. All of his reserves are committed or destroyed. Numerous officers have fallen in battle, and only his center force remains intact and ready. But all is not doom and gloom for the Confederacy. Before the battle was joined, Lee sent a message to the 3,000-strong garrison at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, requesting support, and initial trickles of Confederate reinforcements under A.P. Hill begin arriving at a 17-mile quick march. It is time for the Federal assault on Lee's center. Defended by a thinly stretched patchwork of divisions and brigades, Lee's only hope is for Hill's main force to come, and come quickly. Burnside's men are ready to begin at 3 p.m., and he orders an echelon attack against Lee's position at Sharpsburg. The Federals start strong, pouring into the outskirts of Sharpsburg and overrunning several rebel positions and gun emplacements. But almost as soon as the fighting begins, Hill's main force from Harper's Ferry takes to the field, many wearing captured Federal uniforms. The sudden appearance of these blue-clad Confederates sows confusion in the Union ranks, and Hill's men intercept a drive from the Union to swing around the rebel right flank. Burnside, in a stunning display of competence, commits his reserves to answering Hill's attack. The I get the feeling that our friend Griffin does not like Burnside when he says in a stunning display of competence. 
Burnside's a solid general. Okay, listen. Again, another one of those guys that gets a bad rap because of Fredericksburg. And again, I will defend him till the day I die that Fredericksburg is not on him. There were many other factors that were completely out of Burnside's control. Um, I'm not saying Burnside was a great general. He's not Grant or Lee or anybody like that. But he's, he's not incompetent. Triumph of Hill's arrival is replaced by deadlock. The rebels hold on tight, and a bloody stalemate takes hold as both sides continue slugging it out until darkness falls. After all the blood and death, the shattering of units, and loss of commanders, neither side can truly claim victory. Antietam is a bloody draw. But again, the difference here is that while the casualties are pretty similar, um, the percentage is much higher. This is a quarter of Lee's army gone. Uh, and, and so McClellan's still got now, he's now got at least 70,000 men against maybe 30,000 Confederates who have all fought and fought hard. Um, he should have pushed this. He really should have pushed it. He could have won a decisive victory at, at Antietam. It is a draw that utterly devastates the Confederate army, however. Lee's men have been all but annihilated, and his staff begs him to pull back. So basically what you would call this is uh, it's tactically a draw. Neither side has won on the battlefield. Uh, basically everybody holds pretty much the same positions they held. There's a little bit of gain by the Union, uh, but strategically it's a victory. Why? Because Lee has invaded the North, that invasion has been stopped and turned back, and he has to pull back to Virginia. So in terms of the strategy, in terms of the campaign, the campaign has been won by the Union. But Lee doggedly refuses, declaring that if McClellan wants to try again come morning, he will be waiting. McClellan's men haven't fared much better, however, and McClellan orders his artillery arrayed on the high ground with his infantry dug in to defend it. The next day, September 18th, Lee is convinced to withdraw. The Battle of Antietam would see 22,717 Americans become casualties in 12 hours of combat. It remains the single bloodiest day in American history. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia left the field a hollow shell, and with the defeat of Braxton Bragg in Kentucky not long after, the rebels' need for foreign aid became ever more dire. But Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, issued not long after the Battle of Antietam, would reframe the Civil War in the eyes of the world as a fight to end slavery. Yeah, so it's it's a brilliant political move by, by Lincoln. And Lincoln initially wanted to issue it in the summer. Uh, and he's wisely counseled by his uh, cabinet to wait, that it would seem desperate because things weren't going well, especially in the East. Uh, and so he holds off. And he issues it after Antietam because Antietam is about as close as they're going to get in the East to a victory anytime soon. Uh, and it does. It reframes the war uh, as b being about more than just preserving the Union. Now it's becoming more about something else. It's about slavery. And you're, you're much less likely to see uh, foreign intervention uh, when the war is reframed in that way. And I think Lincoln probably knew that and make supporting the Confederacy untenable. The Confederacy's ambitions of invading Maryland and taking Washington went up in smoke, and the way was clear for the Union to strike back at the Battle of Fredericksburg. But that is for another video. All right, hey, that was good. Um, obviously, a couple of minor quibbles I had with them, but I think overall it was really well done, well presented. Obviously, a lot of work has gone into this, so I commend him for that. And uh, I think, by and large, with all his videos, he does a great job. So uh, kudos to you, Griffin, for that. Thanks for sharing it with us, and I cannot wait to bring you some amazing stories from the battlefield at Antietam uh, and do so with some of my friends uh, from some of my favorite YouTube channels out there as well. So be watching for that. Link in the description to the original content if you want to check out the Armchair Historian uh, and see some of his other videos as well. Thank you to all of our patrons. We'll see you again soon.